I think we might be up, guys. There we go. Uh, music. Uh. There we go. Welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet radio show offering the latest news and interviews with the people driving business, technology, and politics in Michigan. Now, your hosts, Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another uh, edition of the M Squared TechCast on a drizzly Monday fall morning here in Detroit. Yeah, uh, and we have with us... Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say the plug got pulled on summer. I was at a golf outing yesterday and it was beautiful, of course. And, and everyone was talking about winter literally is coming tomorrow, or at least fall. So but it is Michigan. Yep, absolutely. And uh, it's almost October, so it's definitely time. But let's bring on our first guest here, Kathleen Norton Schock, who is a uh, longtime guest of this show, which is pretty close to going into its fifth year, I think. Yeah, I think Something we are. Like yeah, yeah, we've been at this for a while now. And uh, so Kathleen, you're going to talk to us today about um, with, with two of your many hats on. Uh, the first is uh, Diva Tech Talk, host of that uh, fine podcast. And the other hat is the uh, Michigan Council of Women in Technology. So whichever one you'd like to start with, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you letting me go out of the box last month to talk about freedom of speech and um, and technology insofar as litigation is concerned, et cetera. Uh, and the month before, I did concentrate very much on my passion project with Nicole Scheffler, which is called Diva Tech Talk. Um, but because I gave short shrift in both of those podcasts to my other main passion, which is, of course, I'm a 17-year volunteer for the Michigan Council of Women in Technology Foundation, uh, I'm going to spend most of this podcast talking about MCWT. Um, but just to mention Diva Tech Talk, we will be doing one more podcast uh, probably midway through October, and we will have reached our hundredth mark in five years. Again, for Nicole and I, that is part of our charity work. We do it maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks. And for anybody who'd like to hear that library of the current 99 podcasts that have been done to inspire girls and women to enter the tech field, please go to www.diva, D-I-V-A, tech, T-E-C-H, talk, T-A-L-K.com. They are timeless with a lot of common threads and, and themes. But to get to MCWT, the Michigan Council of Women in Technology, I'm a 17-year volunteer. It's an almost 20-year-old organization. It is the premier nonprofit in the state of Michigan supporting the growth of women and girls and diversity and equity among women and girls in technology. Um, as you guys know, we've been around a long time. We've gotten to do a lot of things. Our website is www.mcwt.org. And I have a lot of things to talk about because I didn't talk about it in the last 60 days. So first of all, as you remember, probably when I was on in June, I mentioned that we were, um, or July, I was mentioned that, mentioning very quickly that we had had our Southeast Michigan golf outing, which was in its 15th year. And it was the third most profitable we had had, despite the fact that we only had, you know, we had only two thirds of the number of normal golfers. Well, for years, we've been trying to expand in a more dramatic fashion into the Western side of the state. We've had many programs there. We've had scholarship programs there, et cetera. But we finally moved our fundraising over there in a serious way. And on September 21st, and it's so interesting, Mike, you mentioned golf. Uh, we did our inaugural very first West Michigan Golf Classic. We raised in our first year $70,000 for our multiple programs. We had 87 golfers, uh, all appropriately masked and maintaining social distance, except obviously when they were out on the course. Uh, three executives who golfed with us from major sponsors of ours, Stryker, Whirlpool, and Spectrum Health. Plus, we had over 20 volunteers work the event to ensure that it was safe uh, and would be profitable. Um, and we had 16 sponsors total, including, and this is really great for us, we have a community partner that we've had for about five years. We 
We've been talking to them for a while and finally under Rosemary Bayer and then Kim Cross, we brought in a strong relationship with Grand Circus to whom we have often given money and support for their programs. And they came in on the event as our community partner. Um, I'd like to do a few shout outs about that event because it was our first event. A woman by the name of Candy Wilkerson led that team of 20 volunteers, sort of like herding cats. And we have a longtime um, male supporter who is the vice president of Secure 24. His name is John Bonapace, and I've known him since his uh, star Sun Microsystems and then Oracle days. But John has been leading our golf outings into strong profitability for over a decade. Also, Sentinel One, in their very first year of sponsorship, was our theme sponsor, our uh, signature sponsor for the event. And we want to thank Brian Schnabel, who did a wonderful job, uh, first of all, getting his own sponsorship, but also among the 16 sponsors, he introduced us to three of them. So as you may know, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, this year's president is Melanie Kalmer, who is the CIO for Dow, another Western, sort of semi-Western company. Um, and she has been really spearheading our growth into Western Michigan, which we've been doing in fits and starts for seven to eight years. So we're really excited. And because the event went so well, even in COVID times, uh, in September of 2021, we'll be doing it again, hopefully double the amount of profit. And it'll be at the Stonewater Country Club in Caledonia, Michigan that year. Uh, then to move on, we have some deadlines this week. So I was so glad you guys were gonna let me on this week. First of all, on September 30th, our Ignite Mentoring Program, which is a benefit to our middle-aged, younger and older members, but those who want and need additional mentoring and counseling, we've been doing Ignite Mentoring for going on nine to 10 years. And applications for both mentors and mentees are still open at our website, www.mcwt.org. And the deadline is September 30th. Um, also, another deadline for us is that, as you know, we've given close to $1.5 million worth of scholarships over the last 15 years to undergraduate and graduate school women in the state of Michigan who are pursuing technology education. And our applications for those scholarships for the next year, in other words, starting now, and we'll be awarding them in 2021, open up on October 1st at www.mcwt.org. And additionally, We've done a website competition for middle school and grade school girls, and that will also open October 1st on our website. And that's for fifth graders through 12th graders. And I think last year we had over 200 applicants and teams, um, uh, 200 teams rather who competed. Uh, we had more than that in the number of applicants. And that's always an exciting event. And we usually do the judging in December or so. Um, also, this past weekend, we had a great event that we've been co-sponsoring with the Girl Scouts for a number of years. It's called Girls Rock IT, and this year we called it Cyber Girls Rock IT, so we did a little bit of a new branding. Um, that went really well. It was sponsored by Blue Cross Blue Shield, as I said, and again, as part of our Western Michigan expansion, Stryker will be sponsoring another version of that along with West Michigan Girl Scout chapters uh, in around November. Um, and last but not least, every year, you guys have heard me talk for years now about the IT prom, right? It's when everybody gets dressed up, we always have a theme, and it is the big black tie event that MCWT has done for easily 14 years. It is our number one fundraiser of the year next to golf, well, actually in front of golf. This year, because we are in the middle of a pandemic, we will be doing it virtually. Uh, the theme of this year is called Embrace the Moment which makes so much sense, right? From a branding perspective. Um, most of the women that I am close to at MCWT have more than embraced this move to digitalization, which has been part of our, our nation's response to COVID, right? So our host this year is Fiat Chrysler Automotive. And one of my dear friends is their global chief information officer, Mantha Chamarthy. You may have heard of her. She was the chief digitalization officer for ZF, ZF up until about a year and a half ago. And prior to that, the CIO for um, Consumers, Consumers Energy. So Mantha is part of our leadership on this event. Uh, we had to pivot as many companies as possible uh, to take, take over and become you know, part of our sponsorship here. Um, please take a look at the website, www.mcwt.org. 
the date for our virtual IT prom, and we invite you to dress up, do whatever you'd like if you're a sponsor or a donor or if you want to attend, will be October 17th from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. So the open bar will be at your house or your office, um, but we'll still promise to have it be a lot of fun and there, as usual, be a fair amount of content. So that means um, if I wear a tuxedo, then I just wear the upper half. I don't. I can like have shorts on underneath and stuff. Hey, I'm going out to dinner tonight, and I'm wearing this. But right now, I'm wearing yoga pants because I did yoga this morning, and I intend to change to jeans. So I invite you to follow my great example. Actually, okay. for the last four years, because I've been doing the social media for the event, I have not shown up, but I've been sitting in my jammies at a kitchen table, tweeting as people were sending me pictures. So this year for me, there will be next to no change. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the same time, I remember having a great time just doing it while all my friends were, you know, as I said, either tweeting me or calling me or sending me things. Um, the content, of course, will have to be very creative about. But again, I love the brand. Embrace the Moment is so much a part of who the agile, talented technology women of MCWT are. And not just the women, right? 20% of our membership is also men. And we have a lot of male sponsors like a John Bonapace, who I mentioned earlier. So whether you participate individually or you invite your spouse to come or you bring other guests, you know, you can always be sitting around your own kitchen table and join us. But we do ask that you do sign on to our website to check it out at www.mcwt.org. Uh, also, in the month of October, we'll have a bunch of our lunch and learns. I also talked about them a little bit in July. We do them every month, some at noon, some in the evening. And you can see those invitations if you follow us on the website, or also I, I handle our Facebook site and our LinkedIn site. And we put invitations to all of those various events out there constantly. Uh, we're a little less active these days on Twitter. Um, but one of the exciting things for me is two of our newest volunteers on the marketing team are 17 years old and 16 years old, respectively. So they're about to take over our Instagram and Twitter accounts. So I imagine those are going to blow up in the fourth quarter in a fascinating way. So baby boomers and Generation Z combining for the exact same mission, furthering women in tech in the Silicon Valley of the Midwest, Michigan. Got about two minutes left. Okay, well, um, that was pretty much, as usual, I, I speak too quickly. Um, I will say that we've been very, very grateful to the Girl Scouts for their co-sponsorship of Girls Rock IT. When we first started it some years ago, um, we did not have them as a, a direct par partner and we were struggling a little bit. And all of a sudden, once we got the Girl Scouts, when we had actual in-person events, there were thousands of girls coming and hearing our message. And we discovered that that continued into the cyber version of it that we had this past weekend. So we love the Girl Scouts and everything they stand for, but we particularly love our Michigan partnership um, with Girls Rock IT. And we hope that continues ad infinitum. Um, so that's about it for me. Um, Nicole, one last thing, there's a new diva in the world. My co-founder of Diva Tech Talk uh, has recently given birth to Stella Scheffler. Oh. So we now have Stella for star, right? So we will have, now we have four divas, right? I mean, we have myself, we have Nicole, and we absolutely have both of her babies. <laughs> so that's it on my side. All right. So give us once again, those website addresses right. for people to look up both groups. Right. Diva Tech Talk is at www.diva, D-I-V-A, tech, T-E-C-H, talk, T-A-L-K.com. And the Michigan Council of Women in Technology, 20 years leading girls and women so that we can diversify that field in a dramatic fashion and have Michigan lead in diversity, diversifying IT is at www.mcwt.org. All right. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, Kathleen Norton Schock, for another fabulous 15 minutes. Great spending time with you as always. Uh, we'll be right back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast in just a moment. For right now, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you're watching MITechnews.tv. See you, Kathleen. 
What do you get at Lawrence Technological University? All right, so just uh, mute Great your camera and your. Uh... Hey, I just uh, I pinged Terry. I haven't seen him join in yet. Oh, there's no Terry yet. Need to succeed. Be smart. Be more. At LTU, possible. I have an extra 15 minutes. Who knows? Time for a text, Mike. <laughs> and I said a reminder again uh, this morning just to make sure. Oh, there he is. Oh, Lawrence Technology. 30 seconds to spare. Earn a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, hey, Terry. earning potential, the Brookings okay, Institution ranks yeah, there you go. Fifth good. among U.S. Ooh, colleges and well, I like the, I like the beard. Be yeah. Be more. At LTU, the way contest there. Everything. Yeah, right. Uh, Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads. <laughs> I'm sure he will speak in short declarative sentences. In well, he lives on the water, so, I mean, it makes sense. Okay. Just need an eye patch now. Wait, find out more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's Matt Rouse. Hi, Macy. Yeah, hey, yes, and Mike Brennan, and we have uh, Captain uh, Terry Bean with us today. Uh, <laughs> he just came in from overseas to do this uh, this video podcast. Uh, no, and yeah. boy, are his arms tired. That's we we right. kid okay. him because he, he lives on a lake somewhere <laughs> in the metro Detroit area. Uh, it's because I see his Facebook stuff all the time. So, but anyway, his big event is coming up on Wednesday, uh, TEDx Detroit, and I'll let you fill in the details, Terry. Oh, man, we're doing something totally different this year, guys. We've been rolling the dice on this thing for a dozen years. This is number 12, if you can believe that. Uh, but this time, it's two things are big time different. One, you can enjoy it from the comfort of your own whatever, car, home, office, doctor's <laughs> office, you know, dental chair. We don't really care. Um, and two, and then probably more important, it's Free. Not a dollar. Thank you to our friends at United Shore, now UWM or soon to be UWM. You know, it's always fun. I don't know if you get you guys work with enough businesses and brands that are doing sponsorship. Sponsor a big event and then do a name change like right then. Like, it's awesome. All right. So uh, let's start off with uh, where do people dial in to get connected? What's the what's the web address? Well, starters, let's go to TEDx detroit.com so tedxdetroit.com gets you the place where you would go register for your free seat and then what we're ending up doing is we're going to be using a platform for from ann arbor based connect space so our friends len and the rest of the team out there in ann arbor put together a really cool virtual networking platform a place where you can watch videos a place where all, all the action is going to take place Ooh. Now, is okay. there any, oh, sorry, is there any interactivity? Can people reach out to the speakers or anyone and ask them questions, things like that? Some of the speakers have agreed to do a Q&A. So I'm not exactly sure. Um, my goal is to pull it off this way. If you're in session one as a speaker or session two as a speaker, uh, people can write and do their little chat questions. Then we're going to gather the questions. We're going to send those to the speakers and allow them to answer. If everything goes as smoothly as planned, which let's be honest, who knows if that's going to happen. Yeah. But if it does, Wednesday evening before set three, we're going to try and do a little live Q&A through Facebook with the speakers that are getting asked the questions. Um, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be fun. Uh, and it's going to be a whole different ball game that like I'm already tired thinking about it, guys. Like I said, 12 years in, this is the first time I've ever really been, this is exhausting, but we're remaking the whole thing as we go. What else can you do? Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, let's let's talk about the history of this a little bit. I, I know I, I love, now that I work at Lawrence Tech, I love pointing out to people that the very first one in 2009, I think, was uh, was at Lawrence Tech. And I know there couldn't have been more than 300 people there because that's our biggest auditorium is 300 <laughs> people. Um, but, exactly. but my how my how you've grown i mean what what kind of crowds were you were you getting for this thing the last couple of years you know we tickled four thousand people the last two years when we were at the masonic temple so it's been more than a 10x growth uh it's been an amazing labor of love the first time we did it 
there were there were four of us that were putting it on and for those that got there early they'd remember charlie Wahlberg running in and you know charlie charlie doesn't run often man but he was running <laughs> in carrying the box of name badges that's how that's how that one went and quite frankly we're every bit is organized and as on top of it today as we were day one. Yes, I know. Yeah, it, a lot it, of it does have a, a very fun, it does have a very fun aspect of, hey, my, my uncle's got a bar and kids, let's put on a show, you know, that, that kind of atmosphere to it. But that's, that's also part of the magic of it. I mean, you, you go to something like this and you learn things you had no idea you were going to learn. Um, you know, I never knew Randall Charlton, who was a, a pharmaceutical executive in the Detroit area, went broke running a restaurant in Australia or something like that earlier in his career. You know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing the stuff that comes up at these. Things, so. It is. It's pretty crazy. It is. You know, it's almost like uh, you're going to get on the TED stage and you get handed a spoonful of truth serum before you go out there and start talking. It's pretty funny. Yep. So, so who are some of the speakers you want to highlight that, uh, and I imagine they're coming in from around the country as it were, right? You know, the, a lot of times they do. They come in from around the country because the rule for being on a TEDx Detroit stage is you either need to be from the Detroit area or have ties to it, meaning you worked here for an extended period of time or you went to school here. So we've always had that as a rule. Um, this year, though, they don't even have to come in. So I'm super excited. I've been trying to get Al Jean who's the executive producer, longtime writer and showrunner of The Simpsons. He's oh. speaking this year, man. So I'm a huge Simpsons fan. I'm even wearing yellow to talk about Al Jean. So I'm <laughs> thrilled about that. Uh, we've got some, some new folks, LZ Granderson's coming. That's gonna be really exciting. Uh, Alicia Gabriel and Deidre Robertson are going to be here, and that's going to be fun. These are folks that are kind of in the first set, and I should probably explain one of the main differences. Nine, excuse me, ten to eleven thirty is session one. Two until three thirty is session two, and eight until nine thirty at night is session three. So instead of it being a 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. kind of thing, we're doing these breakouts over three different sessions, I think, so people can stretch their legs. So I want to, you know, I want to make sure that we, we know a little bit about that. Um, Jacob Brown is one of the new speakers that's going to be coming. We're excited about him. Eric Thomas is going to be speaking as well. So we've got some, we got some good folks that are really kind of making their TEDx debut. The other thing where I'm thrilled about is we're going back and we're revisiting with some of our favorite TEDx speakers in the past. So there's going to be a couple of comedians, three of them, in fact, that have graced our stage in the past. And we've got three magicians that have graced our stage and some of our favorite speakers like Leon Lebrecht and Kari Turner uh, are coming back and they're going to share what's going on and what's new in their world, too. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about what the theme of the sum of the presentation is? I mean, is it is it timely stuff like having to do with, oh, I don't know, pandemics and a, a racial reckoning in this country, you know, any any of that kind of stuff? Those are those the light the, stuff, you well, know. So, yeah, that, that, the, that the election, those seem to be the three uh -huh. big uh, topics in the country right now. The, the, yeah, the light and the fun. I, I will yeah. tell you, I've only I've only actually witnessed a few of the talks, and, and so I would never try and give it away. But I will tell you that one of the talks is absolutely dealing with racism in this country and how that looks, and that's coming from a coming from an African American gent. And I think it's going to be a powerful, powerful talk. I will tell you that we're taking a look at the economy and how it's like the ecological system, right? And how it ebbs and flows similar to ecology. And that's a brilliant talk and I'm excited about that. Um, as far as anything pandemic related, I, you, we've got a couple of MDs talking. I have not been privy to their talk, so I can't tell you what their, what their topic is going to be, but it would make sense that they may mention it briefly. So, yeah, but- we don't do we don't do themes, right? Our our theme is always ideas worth spreading, which is what Ted's whole goal is: ideas worth spreading, and it's you know what the what the rest of the world needs to see coming out of Detroit. 
that's that's been our that's been our missive since day one. It won't change. Now, have right. there been have there been other online TED versions uh, so far this year due to the pandemic? And have you you know stolen any good ideas from those, or you know, or is this a completely locally baked uh, production? You know, Charlie and I, man. I uh, he said to one of our speakers that uh, he said this may surprise you, but we're making this up as we go. And I wrote back, we've been making shit up together since 2009 and individually since 1969 and 70 respectively. Yeah. Right. So it's just kind of who we are. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta innovate. You gotta do what you're doing. I mean, there was somebody actually mentioned on our board talk about, well, maybe we shouldn't do it this year. Like, <laughs> you're off the team. You got to go. That's no. it. You're out of here. <laughs> So uh, the beauty of uh, these things, of course, just like this show is we're live. Yes. But then, as you know, I produce it as segments afterwards. And are you doing the same thing? Because a lot of people obviously, you know, it's hard to do live events because stuff comes up and they can't be there live. So are you going to offer it on demand? So the one thing about TED Talks is you if you don't make it for the day, right, you don't get to see it until those videos are actually released. All right, so we're going to do that same sort of thing. We'll have the, the videos will be available that day, but then at midnight, it's, it, they're gone, right? Until they get published through the TED website. If we, I don't know if we're going to make any exception on that. I really don't. Um, so I can't, I can't fully speak to that. There are, there are areas of the production team that they don't let me anywhere near similar to when I asked my wife if she needs help in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can wash the dishes, Terry. That's the help I need from you in the kitchen. Let's uh, clean up the kitchen afterwards and we're good. Yep, yep. yep. that's okay. I, I know my strengths, I stay out of the way. All right, and then how long typically, what's the turnaround on something like that? I mean, is it talking days, weeks before they're turned around in, in previous taxes? In previous TEDx's, it was usually uh, more incumbent on us than on TED, and it normally took about a week or so once we got them. So that meant it could be anywhere from two weeks to two and a half months. This year, I have a sneaking suspicion it'll be quicker, and they'll be out probably sometime before October ends would be my best. Please do not hold me to that. I always tell people, if I'm the only one nodding, that means you should listen to the person who's going like this. Yeah. So I don't <laughs> have anybody here who has my back, so. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's give them that address one more time, uh, just so that, uh, I'll, and I'll try to produce, I'll get Dave to send me the, the, uh, the full length version of the show is maybe today, and then I'll try to produce yours first, because I know we're under a time deadline, so I can get it out for you, so. But uh, yeah, so, sure. that's, uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's what Dave's here for. I'm just, I'm, oh. I'm just here to wait around, you know, to help Terry. That's, that's what I'm here for. That's good. That's, well, I, that's I knew that was a reason. So, uh, <laughs> so, so about, anyway, it's about time we've come to an understanding in our relationship, Mr. Phillips. Hey, thank you for that. It's, it's, it's just going back to my TEDx years. Detroit talk, man. Trying to make things suck less. That's our goal. And yeah, maybe you could even that, talk and uh, get them on on his show tonight. So uh, I'll let you do that. So. Uh, <laughs> it that's virtual too yeah, yeah so the address is very cleverly hidden ted x detroit.com so we can we can find that we can remember that even even yeah, the somehow we will suss that out right exactly yeah no doubt you can <laughs> always search for it if you can't remember it right <clears throat> uh, all right well cool so uh, of all the speakers that are speaking i know you're talking about the 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 guy from the simpsons is that the one you're hoping that really comes through the most of all the speakers or are there others too i you know what in all sincerity there's a gentleman named kari turner who i mentioned i hope that i hope that his talk gets the most play al Jean and the simpsons is a is a pet project of mine as i said i've chased after him for seven years to get him on this stage um, and I've seen that talk. It is not going to be the most remembered TED talk. It is, it's fun and it's fascinating, but Al's a, Al's a joke writer, which is very different than a joke teller. And, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll witness that. But Kari's talk is one that I think is going to have a lot of meaning 
and could have a, a lot of really good impact on who we are as a society. And I, and I hope it gets heard properly. All right. All right. Thanks very much, Terry Bean. TEDx Detroit is the website for the event, and that's Wednesday, starting at 10 a.m. and continuing off and on until 9.30 at night. So check it out, and it's free this year, which is very cool. All right. For right now, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you're watching uh, the M Squared TechCast on MITechnews.tv. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Technological Thanks, University Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, no problem. Do we have Tamara queued up? When it comes to graduate there salaries, is. LTU Look is in that. America's top 100. Right, guys, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the show. All right. All right. Thanks. If you want to continue to listen to the show, just turn off your mic and your video, and you can listen to the last two segments if you have time. So. I don't, but thank you. <coughs> All right. Thanks. Good talking to you. Bye -bye. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Lawrence Technological University graduates Pretty earn sad. a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, when it comes to earning potential, the Brookings Institution ranks LTU fifth among U.S. colleges and universities. You want to start or you want me to start? At LTU, you can start. is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Well, my new glasses wait, find out yellow. more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. And it's Matt Rausch. And we have a recurring uh, uh, contributor who's joined <laughs> us again today, Tamara Shoemaker from the University of Detroit Mercy. And she runs the Cyber Patriot program here in the state. Uh, let's start off with, again, we always assume people don't know what these things are. So let's start off with that very first question. What is Cyber Patriot? So Cyber Patriot is a middle school and high school competition. Um, that's a virtual competition that's played from October until April each year. And of course, now it's virtual. Well, it was virtual pretty much before, but it right. definitely is now, right? So a Absolutely. The, uh, normally, the only face-to-face -face thing that we do is nationals, but that has to be virtual this, this year and next year. Probably. And okay. uh, at, at what do the students compete? Um, so it's a cybersecurity competition, and it is to make sure that operating systems in both Microsoft and Linux um, are secure and also Cisco networking security. So it's a virtual sort of white hat, black hat type event? It is. It's very exciting. It's very, really good, hands-on, good, uh, good <laughs> cybersecurity practices for young people to learn. Um, and the, the program goes actually from K through 12. So it's a really cool uh, program for, uh, we have some video games for the younger kids as well to sort of get them up to speed in cybersecurity. And it, and it starts out with a strong component on for, for the younger kids about online safety as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Right? Make sure that they're safe right now. And then it sort of builds themselves up until they can sort of, you know, uh, come in and secure a business at the end of the day and keep it safe from bad guys. Cool. And as we all know, uh, getting a job in cybersecurity, there's no shortage of opportunities. It's probably the most in-demand job there is out there. And uh, I've seen all sorts of numbers out there for how many openings there are. Do you have any kind of accurate figures on that? So uh, the most thing that, that sort of struck me the other day when I was doing a little bit of things is that it said, basically it said that we need to have 400 million people in the pipeline currently in order to make- 400 uh, million? 400 in the, in the pipeline in order to supply, um, you know, going out to 2020, uh, 2025. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes us a while to get them through the pipeline, right? Yeah. So if we're going to continue to, I mean, unless, of course, the lights go out and we lose all of our cyber um, and our capabilities, we need a ton of more folks into the pipeline. And so that was a staggering thing to me. So there's like 450 or 405 million jobs, in Michigan, right? And then globally, it continues. Sure. So globally, I, I this number. I think you meant thousand. You're saying 400 million. I, oh, I, sorry. You're right. We don't have that many thousand people in the country, you know? In the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> sorry. But uh, globally, we have this huge need. And again, it takes so long for them to get into the pipeline that we need to have that many in the pipeline in order to, sure. to do the need. And, and speaking yeah, and you, of that, you, I was going to say, you've you referred to the educational system as a as a funnel. There you go. That's what uh, and say. that's and that's not what we need right now, right? No. Expand on that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, no, no, it's not at all. But what we really need is a fire hose, right? So we really needed to, to sort of flip that that funnel over, um, and start to turn out millions of cybersecurity warriors, right? Um, as soon as we can. 
Um, and that's been a problem for traditional uh, education. All right. And you often talk about culture change regarding cybersecurity. Uh, what do you mean by that? So we've, we've, um, we've been treating sort of cybersecurity as the super spy secret kind of, kind of thing that's, you know, first, you know, IT, and then you need this other kind of uh, tool in your tool belt that's really scary and very, very difficult to get into. Um, and you must need to, you know, enjoy being by yourself and enjoy uh, hard math and all that kind of good stuff. And it's not necessarily that. Um, it's truly uh, a lot more just plain best practices in cybersecurity, keeping in mind that you have bad actors that are going to exploit any vulnerabilities. But those vulnerabilities are not just in the hardware and software, which is what we traditionally think of. It's in the hardware, it's in the software, it's in the apps, absolutely. But it's also very important, we need to stress, it's also in the humans that are behind the keyboards and in the fire and behind the firewalls, you know, they're in the company. And so the, those, those other areas, we're not really covering. So we're covering 30% of the problem with the technical issues, but we're not covering the other 70% that are the actual human factors type of things. Yeah, um, I, I, remember, I remember hearing an old story, gosh, it must be 20 years ago now, where a company hired a cybersecurity consultant and the guy was able to send the CEO an email from his own account uh, within two days just by you know doing human factor stuff like looking like he worked at the place and standing outside with a bunch of people uh, taking a smoke break and getting back into the building with a pass and you know all that stuff just sort of snowballed you know right. and, and he was and he was able to send the CEO an email from his own account within two days which is not the kind of security you want obviously no because if you're not all secure you're not totally secure in all mm -hmm. areas then you're not secure at all right so if there's a way around things which is what the really good bad guys do right is find those way around I mean we still are having problems problems with pass passwords being insecure. We're still having problems with people clicking on things that are attached, um, you know, really, really basic, easy, basic things that, that they still haven't figured, you know, we still haven't been able to change the culture to let people know that all people that are employed right now have to have some level of cybersecurity awareness so that they don't blow it for the whole company, for the, for the state, for the government, for all of us, right, that are out here. Yeah. Well, you also, I know you've talked about, you know, besides the culture change about education and industry putting unintended barriers into hiring uh, and educating cybersecurity professionals. What do, you, what do you mean by those, those unintended barriers? So for the most part, we're still, we're still fighting uh, last, our last war, right? It's all, uh, you know, it's either, either one or the other. It's either physical or it's, it's, it's technology. And it's, it's not now. Now it's both of those things. So we're still trying to hire people that look like us. We're still trying to hire people that have our backgrounds. We're still, um, look. we're not looking for a diverse uh, 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 workforce. And in order to, to beat the bad guys, because they are very diverse, they are using all kinds of skill sets in this, right? They're not used to just following along the normal path that you would think of as some cybersecurity person would go, which what our intent, what, what we think our lens has shown us. Um, we really need to bring a bust out of that kind of a, a way of going at things. We need to make sure that we know um, who's doing the hiring. So what do they what do they physically look like? What are, who where's their background like? Um, so that when they're doing the interviewing, they're not just looking for a clone, right? We need to know how are you casting that net, right? How are you actually going out there and finding these people? Are you going on to? Are you pushing? Are you throwing things out onto a website, hoping people are going to come by, or are you actually actively going for? A diverse population, um, and and even how you word it, everything, right? So they were just saying that they that if they put out a, um, a an advertisement for a hacker, they're going to get an only male population to respond to that. But if they come in and they say that you want someone to defend their system, then they have a much more diverse population that that come into that. So what words we use, how we look, and how we act as we're doing it, um, what we're looking for. Um, many of the uh, HR folks and people that I talk to across the nation are looking for um, things that we needed 10 years ago um, and not the things that we currently need today. Um, and, and just where are you looking? You know, are you actually casting that net in, in a place where you're going to get a new, a new, a different, a diverse population of, of people that are going to come in and do this? Which begs the question, what do we need today that we didn't need or we were using 10 years ago? 
So we need a completely different kind of, 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 of person, right? So we need, and we still need our highly technical folks. There's no doubt about that, right? So our, our, when we're thinking about this in the education space, many people say, we know we need comp sci, computer science, and we need engineers. We of course still need those folks, but we also need people who are artistic types. We also need people who um, are great writers. We need critical thinkers. We need folks that can analyze things in a different kind of way. We need folks that don't look like us that are on this show right now <laughs> um, and that think differently than we do because the bad guys are not coming at our firewalls alone, right? They're finding, like you said, Matt, you had some great examples about how they can get around you know, the, the barrier, the things that we think are there and are keeping us secure. Um, but we need to look better. We need to do a better job of finding those other types of people um, to come on, into this field. And we need to expose them to that. And that's one of the things that I use the Cyber Patriot program for all the time is to expose them to a much larger group of um, people. In fact, um, NICE, the NICE framework, which is our, our cybersecurity workforce framework, the government took years putting together and OPM, which is the Office of um, um, Placement and Management for the whole federal government, put together this, this thing. It has seven categories of type of, of what we're looking for. And out of that seven, only three of those are truly traditional computer science engineering type degrees. Um, and there are 950 different career pathways in that. That's a lot of different kind of pathways. And we really are only looking at this it, with, you know, it, it with a different, you know, with a very small lens and it needs to be much, much broader. So it's not just coders that you're looking at then? No, no, like I said, we always are going to need that, right? Because we need to uh, be able to do uh, adaptations to anything that we've got that we need to integrate and all that kind of good stuff. We need still, really still need app developers and software developers and all that kind of good stuff. But we also need people <coughs> in some of the other areas that are not thought of as cybersecurity people. All right. So, uh, but you were saying that you feel that increasing the amount of computer science and engineers isn't enough. So that's, is that kind of tie in with what you just said where you yeah. gotta get the broader yeah. reach out there? We really do. So we have other areas, right? So the, the seven areas are securely provisioned and that's definitely computer science and engineering um, to secure you know, those, those things. Operate and maintain is also sort of in that stream but it's more of, of IT, total op, you know, good, good IT practices. Um, protect and defend is definitely uh, in that vein. So those are the first ones that are actually in what we normally think. But then you get into investigate, um, and that's that's not that's a criminal justice field, right? So that's actually how do you maintain? How do you get the evidence? How do you prosecute? You know those kinds of things. There's collect and operate, and that's pure intel. That's the pure intel stuff. You know, think of the three-letter agencies: FBI, CIA, NSA. Those kind of kinds. It's a spycraft, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to know what the bad guys are doing and how to how to stop that right before it actually becomes an intrusion. There's collect and operate. I mean, I'm sorry. There's analyze, which is analyzing all the data, right? And that's not a that's not an IT function. That's not a cybersecurity, a technical function. That needs to be critical thinkers that get into that. And then oversee and govern, which is more a pure business type of thing, where you have to actually take all the regulations. And all the things that govern us as a as a as an industry, as a, as as business and IT, and how that all works in cybersecurity, and learn those processes. So those none those are not at all technical, right? Those are completely different kinds of fields, and so we have to draw from those other fields and bring them into cybersecurity. I mean, and just make sure everyone knows that those fields are jo cybersecurity jobs, right? A little over a minute left. So, so what, tell us a, a little bit about what's happening in Cyber, Cyber Patriot right now, this month. Wonderful. So <laughs> we're continuing on. We, should, we, we, we we think that we're going to have a, a strong year, even, even stronger maybe even, because now we are probably the only sport and the only after, after, after school activity in a lot of schools that are on, online only. So it's registration time. So it's time for our coaches and our schools to get together. So they have to do that before October 13, uh, 15th. Um, even if they're not sure that they're going to have a full team, please register because you can't, after the date is closed, you can't add, right? So you can take away. So you can say, you know, I didn't make enough, enough kids to make a team or to make several teams like I thought. So you just take away the ones that you didn't get. Um, we're very fortunate that we also have some lesson plans, some um, practice images, 
and all kinds of wonderful help from our friends out in California, Alan Stubblefield, and you can get a hold of me to get a hold of those wonderful things so you can truly jump in and have a ton of lessons. And the really cool thing about that, you guys, is that it's not just an after school program. This information could be in the schools, right? So in the normal classroom. So our teachers that are looking for online uh, resources right now um, can take this stuff and put it right into the classroom and get it moving. Okay, one more time. What's that address where people can get more info? So we have our website is uh, micyberpatriot.com and you can get a hold of me at Tamara Shu at Gmail for any information on the Michigan Cyber Patriot program. All right, once again, Tamara Shoemaker from Michigan Cyber Patriot, thanks so much for being with us today. We'll be back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast in just a moment. For right now, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And you're watching the M Squared TechCast at mitechnews.com. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Tamara. Lawrence Technological Appreciate it. University, everything. Great labs and stuff. <clears throat> Gary queued up, Dave. Plus a full campus life, NAIA athletics, and all the software you need to succeed. Be smart. Be more. At LTU, uh, possible. Speak of the devil. Everything. Hey. Sound well, I wouldn't go that far. Oh, okay. Yeah. Among the highest of any university, in stuff swirling around his head there. Well, I, hi. Am I on the? Am I in the line? And can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear you. We can see you and hear you. Lawrence Technological. Well, there's something weird about my video that I, it, obviously that you guys. I think it's all that immense brain power is just uh, is all that energy. That's what's going on there. You know. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, at it, was, it was supposed to be a really cool video background. Ah, well, it might be you got the wrong background queued up. Well, on it looks Zoom. like I was gonna say it looks a little like the Matrix right now. So. I kind of like it. It's, it's, oh, okay. There there we go. Go. How's that? Wait, find out more at LT. Plain white tea. There we go. No, nope, that's the wrong video. Hey, right. it's Matt Roush and Mike Brennan. That, I like that yep. one there, Gary. What, what, this, is it, what's that behind you now? Is that clear water there behind you? No, that's Sarasota, but it, it looks a little noisy, doesn't it? Yeah. It's got a little static in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just get rid of the virtual background. Although, who knows what you're going to see? Who knows? There we go. Green, I guess. We're going to see green. It looks like green anyway. So yep. we have, there we go, a little live tuning as we as we fly along live. So <laughs> Gary Erickson, uh, the former CIO uh, with a number of award-winning companies uh, in Michigan and beyond, is now the managing partner for executive search partners and we've had gary on the show a number of times uh and his thing is he's looking for uh, well, primarily cio types out there but i mean you take it from here and explain what exactly what you all do so uh, executive search partners um helps companies find senior level it people we mainly focus on uh, companies in the you know small small 300 million up to five billion uh, do a lot of work with CIO positions, director positions. And then occasionally we, we, right now we're doing two searches for a managing director for a very large consulting company. That's, that's a pretty substantial search for us. So that'd be like a good Dave Phillips kind of job then, right? So yeah, that Dave would be wonderful for that. Right, okay. Dave? I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, it looks if, like if, I'm looking if it's away, something I can do from home, if I'm, if it's something I can do from my bar, we can talk. That's yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> So, so, Gary, the, the pandemic has certainly had a big impact, a significant impact on all of our lives and jobs and everything. How has it specifically affected IT positions overall? Yeah, well, I, I was uh, thinking about that. So first off, I think the pandemic has increased significantly the stature of IT people. All right. Um, I've, we've all recognized that the frontline workers have been the heroes of the pandemic. But I think IT people are right behind them. IT's ability to rapidly enable remote work for you, for employees saved jobs and lives because people didn't have to go work next to each other. And then IT's ability to rapidly implement systems to remotely engage with customers saved businesses. The, the second thing I've been, been thinking is that, uh, you know, everybody's talking about working remotely. I think that working for remotely is here to stay. You oh, know, yeah. If you're working outside of your home office, mm -hmm. I, that's different than being a worker remote, which is meaning somebody in another city doing work for your company here. I still think companies are still going to want to hire local and still want to bring people back to the office. Um, and then time from a recruiting time, right? yeah, but, but from a recruiting perspective, we're beginning to see some people asking us for um, 
you know, can you find me some, I'm, I'm primarily San Francisco. We want to find somebody in a cheap area. Can you find me a, 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 a manager or, or a developer who's in Denver, Colorado, for example. And we're beginning to see some of that. It's not a lot. It's not a tidal wave. I think it's just something people are experimenting with. So has the pandemic changed the role of senior IT people then? Well, because of the, um, you know, I think the recognition that um, IT has is, is been critical to the survival of businesses and critical for sort of the changing nature of how you engage with customers, I, I think that's changed and it has changed and will continue to change. The CIO role, CIO role has been slowly shifting from a technology leader to an IT savvy business leader. I think the pandemic, I wanna say significantly accelerated the shift. I think that's an understatement. I think it slammed that shift into full gear and, and senior level executives are going to be looking for their IT manager to be an IT business leader first who knows technology. And, and because of all the work we do in, re, in recruiting senior level positions, I think we're going to see a shakeout in senior level IT positions. There are a fair number of people that we talk to there who are really good technologists, but when we quiz them about how their technology and what they've done has changed the business, enabled the business, engage with customers, reduce costs, they keep coming back to the cool technology that they've implemented. So I think we're going to see a shakeout in the next uh, year or two of senior level IT positions as, as uh, companies who now recognize how important IT is to them. We need somebody at the top and in our senior executive IT leadership who knows the business first and technology second. This might be an opportunity for some schools that teach uh, technology to uh, have incorporate MBAs, sort of basic business training in with the technology and have that sort of hybrid degree. And I'm thinking there's one in Southfield. I don't know if they do that yeah, or not. Yeah. Well, there, there is a reason that, <laughs> that LTU's B school is called the College of Business and Information Technology. Uh -huh. And you can get a, a, a Master of Information Technology um, as it, it's an MBA with an IT focus. Um, so that's, a, that's a, been a degree there for, I don't know, about a decade, I think. So, you know, I mean, there are a lot of schools on top of that. I know there's a couple other schools in Michigan that just um, announced a tech centric business degree. And obviously we've had those for a long time too, uh, where, where you study information systems, not so much from a coding or hardware perspective, although the neat thing about Lawrence Tech is that those classes are available to you because we have a lot of them. Um, but it's really more of a how IT enables the business to do all the things that Gary just talked about. I, my, Gary, I, to your comment, I was a heads down nerd. Uh, my master's degree in computer science was all about um, putting hardware and software together at the bit level. Uh -huh. I mean, really, it was not for me, I, but <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. And then when I got to Ford and started working there, um, I decided I wanted to get my MBA. And that shifted my perception tremendously. I learned that what business is all about and then how IT could fit in there. So you're looking for more people like you, essentially, then, right? So Yeah, well, a little younger, but yeah. <laughs> well, I can't say that, can I? <laughs> no, you well, can't. I, mean, I don't know what we could We can say anything we want on this show. So okay. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, how do, how do you transform all of these trends uh, into advice for existing IT talent? What, what would be your tips, you know, for people who are looking for a job right now? Well, there's, you know, first off, you think about there's, we've always thought about two career paths, the technology career path and the business career path. If you, if you really do want to move up in IT, though, you've got to recognize that IT is a business enabler, not a cost center, not an implementer of cool technology. And the other thing I'm, I, I, I'm going to get a lot of, a, a lot of people tell me, well, this doesn't happen at my company because I report to the CFO or they think of me as a cost center. My reaction there is if they don't recognize how important IT is to you, especially after the pandemic, I think I'd go find another company. Hmm. Yeah, and of course, thing, people, um, people with those kinds of skills, I would think, uh, are going to be very, very valuable going forward, right? Yeah, I would think so, too. I would think that, especially at the senior IT level, um, you know, companies, companies want a leader who says, hey, look, I know we've got uh, computers that run and they've got good uptime, but here's the kind of things we can do to really reduce our costs 
or increased sales. And increased sales is, you know, getting products to customers faster, providing online access to them, providing uh, long-term customer engagement through a number of different uh, venues, including putting technology inside products. So you link it back to the corporate office. An IT person, a leader who thinks that way about how they can enable the business because they can put technology in underneath it, underneath it to make it better, are, are they're invaluable. And they're the only ones that most of our clients are hiring these days. Yeah. And I, I really get the uh, idea that you expressed about how working remotely or working from home or working from anywhere uh, is sort of the new normal because I just have a, an example in my own life. My son's best friend from high school has an IT position at a very IT centric company in Ann Arbor, whose name you would recognize. Um, and he was working uh, in Dearborn. He uh, m visited my son when my son was living in Syracuse, New York, met and fell in love with a girl in Syracuse, moved to Syracuse for a while, then they moved back to Dearborn. And then they moved down to, they just moved down to North Carolina where she's originally from so she could take a teaching position. He has not changed employers, he's changed addresses four times. Wow. So, you know, he could, he could do that job from any place. So, so my, my, uh, my younger son uh, and his very steady, we think, fiance, girlfriend, um, live in San Francisco. Both of them work in Mountain View, but uh, one for Google, one for, and he works for a startup company. Uh, when the pandemic hit, everybody started working remotely. Well, they've spent a month in Florida. They're now currently in Boulder, Colorado. It's the same thing. You know, they can work from anywhere. Yeah. So as we come towards the end of the show, this is the part that everybody wants to know. Hey, I rhymed that. Um, and uh, so what kind of advice would you offer to IT leaders out there? What's the number one thing they should do to get some of these really great jobs that are a begging out there? So, well, yeah, so, and, so, and so they don't get replaced as well. And as you see this wave coming. Yes. Yeah, yeah well... You know, first, you've got to recognize that if you really want to be a senior level person, you've got to know the business and you've really got to learn the business. Uh, ask yourself how much time you spend with with uh, other leaders in the business, just not IT people. Do you go to business conferences? Have you visited your customers, uh, your customers? Have you visited uh, uh, customers of your competitors? Um, but that recognition and that learning is very important. The second thing I recommend, and this is similar to other things I've said, is you've got to have a number of success stories that list what you've done. And, and these at the senior level should be business enablement success stories. And, and I um, don't, don't talk about putting in a new email system. or oh, The cool technology. Don't talk about that, right? Uh, yeah. Um, and when, when you talk about the, what you've done, it's what was the business problem you were trying to solve? What actions did you take or lead? And then what measurable results? And the results measurements need to be business measurements. Not I put in this number of new um, desktops, but this is what it did to sales. This is what it did to company costs. And then the final thing is take those, those success stories and rewrite your resume to show those business enablement accomplishments. Okay. And then when they get that resume done, send it to you, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm, so happy yeah, I was, I'm happy. I was leading more. into that a shameless plug for you, Gary. So <laughs> right. where, where do they, where do they send that newly improved resume? What's the address? Uh, it's G Erickson and it's E R I C K S O N at exec search partners.com. And of course the website is the same thing. Exec search partners.com. Yep. And look for look for top IT recruiting companies in Michigan in the web and you'll find us as number one. And just before you go, I know you do nationwide stuff. But what is going on in Michigan? Are there are people now because of the pandemic? Is there a lot of uh, demand for these types of people here in this state or is it elsewhere? I, you know, I think anecdotally, I think the demand is still down in Michigan. Uh, I don't have statistics on that. And, I, and they usually lag too. The state statistics usually lag by two or three months. So it's hard to tell what's going on. It's got to be improving. But when I look online at uh, LinkedIn and, and uh, Indeed for positions in Michigan, I'm still not seeing the, the numbers that we had pre-pandemic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, thanks very much uh, for Gary Erickson. Uh, 
Thanks for being with us today from Executive Search Partners. I want to thank Gary and all of our guests today. We had Tamara Shoemaker from Cyber Patriot. Remember that sign up deadline for Cyber Patriot teams is October 15th. Terry Bean talking TEDx Detroit, and that is this Wednesday online. And we kicked off the show with Kathleen Norton Schock uh, from the Michigan Council of Women in Technology and Diva Tech Talk. Uh, in case you were wondering, folks, our very own uh, Dr. Doom, the uh, our very own uh, Prince of Pandemics, will be back uh, next week with an update on uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Fred couldn't be with us today, uh, but he, I believe Mikey said he would be able to be with us next week. Yeah, he was uh, out of town doing some family thing, and he said that it, there would be issues with connections, and so he, he would, would it be okay if he passed? And I said... Yeah, we could probably use a week off, you know. <laughs> yeah, he, he's right. very well, frank. Thanks. He's very scary, but he's very frank, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> And very knowledgeable. Um, and we'll be back next week uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time with another edition of the M Squared TechCast. For right now, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you've been watching the M Squared TechCast at MITechnews.com. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Have a nice day. All right. Yep. Have a good, I know it's nice where you.